The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazines. We hope you're enjoying this special time when you can learn and grow as an artist. Today we have a very special video for you, Classical Portraiture with Joshua LaRock. Hey you guys, welcome back. Uh, this is our second day um, in our multi-stage process of making a portrait painting. Um, so what we've done is we, we did our drawing. Um, I went ahead and I made, I made a couple photocopies of that drawing and I enlarged it to um, you know, whatever size I thought uh, might be nice. Usually I'm kind of sticking with like a, like a seven, seven and a half inch high head. Um, that's just like three quarters, just under life size. Usually looks pretty good. But I did do two different sizes. So this is, this is seven inches, this one is seven and a half, just so that I could kind of take it up to my, my canvas and, and get a sense of how, much, how big it was going to be on the canvas, how much space I've got around it, around the portrait. Um, I do think that I'm probably going to go with the, with the slightly smaller one, just for, just for the sake of the composition. I do like the larger one, though. But this is totally up to you, you know. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do transferring, so I'm just going to show you one particular method. I used to do um, graphite transfers for years, so that would be exactly the same as what I'm going to show you here today, uh, but using graphite on the back of uh, the photocopy or the piece of tracing paper uh, instead of oil paint. Um, but first things first, we need to kind of figure out where we want this to be uh, on the canvas. Uh, I think I'm going to do something like that. The other thing that's nice about this transferring process is it gives you a little bit of an option value. So you can you can kind of make some adjustments. You can you know um, you can you can tilt. I think what I'm doing here is I'm kind of tilting it just a little bit more. I was I was looking at the drawing um, overnight and sort of thinking, well, what would it be like if I if I kind of just put it over to the left on the canvas and, and give it a slight tilt. So maybe there's like a, a sense of movement to it rather than being quite so sort of vertically, vertically stacked. Um, <clears throat> I have in the past before, if I wanted to kind of like change the orientation of the head on the shoulders, you actually could cut out the, you know, the, the head from the photocopy and just sort of like play with it, almost as if it was like sort of Photoshop. You could do it in Photoshop if you wanted. So, you know, there's all kinds of options that you have um, to be able to just sort of tweak the, tweak the pose, tweak the expression and character. Um, some other ideas about composition. Uh, in general, with a portrait, it's nice to have, if you're imagining a, a midline, a vertical midline that's halfway between either side, um, if I'm imagining it being somewhere like right here, you don't want the, the, the chin to be too far off of that, off of that midline. Um, you know, rules are always made to be broken, but I think that's just a decent, a decent rule of thumb. Um, in this case, I'm kind of just thinking about positioning her a little bit more to the left side of the canvas than to the right. So there's going to be a little bit more empty space here than there is here. And I can, I can kind of just take a brush and just do like a quick little measurement so to see that they're almost equal. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll just emphasize that a little bit more. Maybe that just gives it a little sense of that, that movement that I was talking about. So I can see that the, the middle of my canvas is lining up right with the corner of that near eye. 
kind of have a look at it here. Another thing is I've got the I've got the the head uh, higher up on the canvas rather than lower down, right? So part of that's so that I make sure that I have enough room here um, for the uh, you know the the seam of the shirt to meet well within the the bounds of the canvas. And uh, I think that looks I think that looks pretty interesting. Got just a little bit more of a tilt than I had yesterday, but you know it's still conceivable that she's she's sitting upright in a chair or standing or whatever. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that taped there. Now what we've got to do is um, prepare prepare our transfer paper. Okay, you could put the the oil right on the back of the photocopy or, or the graphite or whatever, but I'm going to actually use a piece of tracing paper that we'll put up underneath that. Okay. All right, this is any just sort of standard, standard tracing paper. Um, you could use, a, you could use a, a thin piece of computer paper if you want, but it is important that it's thin so that what we're going to be doing is drawing over this, and so you don't want the paper to be so thick that, that, your, that your pencil or your stylus isn't actually creating, um, creating that mark, all right? All right, so we can get rid of this. Here's the old drawing. You can, you can see... I've blown it up about 100, 130%, something like that. You can set it aside. Okay. So, um, as far as materials go, I've got uh, raw umber, just regular raw umber oil paint. And uh, this is, this is uh, a medium called oleo res gel. Uh, basically, it, it's, it's linseed oil with an alkyd resin mixed in there, and it's, put it, it's made into gel form. You could use really anything. Um, we're just trying to get the, the paint to sort of slide on there. The alkyd actually hastens the drying time though, and that's why I like it for this process. Um, we're, you know, just looking for something to, uh, to, you know, set up on the canvas relatively quickly. You could do this the day before, you could do this several days before. Um, I'm going to be painting on this right away. Uh, so, you know, however, however you like to do that. I do have a, a Another medium, this is called transparent base. This is, this is actually a very, very fast drying um, uh, medium, which could be good for this application. So I might kind of mix that in a, a little bit here. Um, I've also got my, my, uh, my Terps container here with, with gam salt, just an odorless mineral spirits. I might be dipping in, um, adding that to the, to the paint on the tracing paper here, as I need to, to just sort of get it to flow out. Um, I will say that this... This takes a little bit of practice. If you put too much solvent, too much of the, the mineral spirits in the mixture on the, on the tracing paper here, uh, it can have a, a, a trouble when you're putting it on the canvas of being just a little bit too messy, or if you put your hand on it, um, then it'll, it'll be a little bit messier. So it kind of takes a little bit of practice to, to figure out how much oil paint you want on here, how dry you want it. Um, but what I like about this is I'm not introducing anything uh, foreign to my, to my painting, right? So it's all oil-based things rather than having graphite or charcoal or... Uh, in the past, I used, to, I used to fix my drawing to the canvas with ink, and that's, that I think um, uh, can have some adverse effects um, with the longevity of your picture. Um, oil paint as it dries always uh, gets a little bit more transparent, so it's possible that the ink could eventually show through. All right, so just got a few daubs of the, um, the French umber out here on the tracing paper. And I'm going to go ahead and just put a little bit of oleo gel, a little daub next to each of them. And I might do the same thing with this transparent base here. It's kind of dried off on me. Get a little dried bits off there. I'm just going to put a little bit of that on, maybe half as much. We'll see how far that gets us. But again, that's just to maybe help this, help this dry a little bit faster. So just an old kind of bristly brush here, sort of beat up, just to help me kind of move this around the canvas, the, the tracing paper. What we're going to do here in a second is, is remove any of the excess so that uh, only the very thinnest amount of oil paint remains 
remains on the tracing paper. You could do this with any color, really. Uh, I like raw umber because it's it's dark enough that it's going to show up on the tone of my canvas, but it's not so dark or red that it's going to be tough to cover up with my first layer of paint. All right, so we kind of got our layer there. Let's take let's take a fresh piece of paper towel. and just sort of remove the excess. All right, so before I, before I put this transfer paper up here, I was, I was just looking at the, the picture from, uh, from a distance standing back. I just felt like I wanted to make a slight adjustment to the composition by, by just moving this down a little bit. Maybe there's just you know a little bit more space um, above the top of her head, and a little bit less here um, at the bottom. Not much. Not much, but I still like that tilt. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the, take the transfer paper. We're going to put the oil painted side uh, facing the canvas, sandwiching it underneath, underneath the drawing. And then I can kind of just stick it here with the, uh, the two pieces of tape that I've already got there. All right, now um, here I'm going to use the, my, my 4H pencil. It's just a harder, harder pencil as opposed to the H. You could use either. Um, I've used a ballpoint pen before. I've used a red ballpoint pen so that you can you can see the lines very clearly that you've that you've already done. Um, but whatever works. We just need some sort of hard stylus to be able to make an impression. So I'm just going to start here with the eye, really just looking to kind of do a very simple transfer, transferring the the major structures of the uh, of the portrait. We'll we'll get a lot of the of a lot of the information back throughout the course of the the underpainting. But we're going to be transferring better lines even if we're not transferring all of the detail, right? So by going through the process of the drawing yesterday, we've ended up with a better drawing and we've connected with it better. Um, and so uh, we'll still have the drawing as a reference for us during the painting uh, and all that. So it doesn't, don't feel like it's a, it's a loss. Um, just sort of be okay with the fact that, you know, it's not going to look quite as good in the, in the transferred image. But, um, you know, there are other ways uh, to do transfers. I so oftentimes will we'll use a projector. So I'll, I'll scan my drawing um, into the computer um, just using any, any, you know, standard old office desk scanner. And then you can use the digital projector to, um, to project it onto your canvas. And uh, um, then you have all kinds of options there. You can make it larger, you can make it smaller, um, you can move it around and, and, and kind of play with, play with all those things. So it's, it can be a really nice, um, really nice tool. So just coming up over here to the other eye. You know, I'm trying not to put too much pressure with my hand. Uh, onto the uh, onto the drawing or the transfer paper because I don't want to I don't want to have any you know um, stray marks or as, as little as I can in any way. Coming down here to the other eye, over to the eyelashes, doing the iris, corner of the eye here, and I'm picking and choosing. You know, I'm not I'm not transferring these lines like the like the side of the nose where. It's, it's very, you know, um, very much in the light. It's very high value. I don't want to have to try to cover up my transfer lines. Um, it's, good, it's good, too, at some point to just kind of like peek and sort of see um, how's the transfer looking. So we're doing good there. Um, all right, so let's continue on. Down the side of the cheek. You know, and I'm trying not to make decisions here, you know. Because I've, I've, um, I've made this, you know, about 130 percent larger than the drawing, then my lines are, you know, slightly thicker than what they were uh, in the in the drawing itself. So I'm not gonna, I don't want to make the decision here which line is correct or which edge of the line. I'm gonna transfer the full thickness of that line, if that makes sense. So.
But anyway, all things are all things are are still fixable. I think I used to, you know, be a lot more stressed out about this kind of a this part of the process and uh, worried that it was going to make or break my painting. And I think as I've just as I've gone on and you know had more experience and um, got more comfortable with underpainting, then I really realized that there's this is a very just low stress kind of uh, thing. We we've got all kinds of opportunities left uh, and time left to to correct mistakes, to make the drawing better, and all that. So just kind of coming around here, finding the edge of the contour of the hair. You know, I'm not the hair. I'm you know even less worried about than other parts because. Um, as I say, it's going to it's going to get designed kind of throughout the the painting process. And as I see, you know, slightly different slightly different ways that the hair is falling, or you know, some little some lock that just sort of catches my interest. Moving pretty quickly here, maybe just an indication of the buttons. There's the cast shadow again on the neck. And that gets sort of fuzzy here, so I don't really need to transfer that. Here's that really nice line for the side of the neck that comes down and meets the, uh, the necklace. All right, I think that was everything. So let's just take a second and double check. So like a you know, kind of like a cartoon, um, you know, an um, illustrator or whatever, just kind of flipping, flipping it back and forth and seeing if I missed anything that was, that was really major. Maybe the, well, no, see, I was going to transfer the top of the collarbone here because that's sort of an important uh, anatomical structure, but then I think I'm just going to kind of leave it and we'll find it in the paint because this is just so soft and so brightly uh, illuminated that I don't want to have to try to cover up those transfer lines, so I think we're okay. Okay, and, uh, and there we have it. All right, so transfer's done. Um, now we've just got to set up our palette and get to the painting. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a second here to talk about materials. Um, you know, I've got, I've got materials that I'm just used to using that I've found and um, that work well. I, I, they are high quality and I really do like them and recommend them. Um, but, you know, I always like to just sort of give, a, you know, a certain disclaimer that says that use what you're used to, you know. I mean, you can, all the principles are going to apply uh, no matter what brand you make and, or you use. Um, so don't feel like you have to go out and buy exactly what I've got here in order to be able to, you know, do the same techniques and things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, that being said, though, I do love to use rosemary brushes. Um, they are really high quality paint maker, uh, paintbrush maker. And uh, so we've, we've put together a set together for, for my portrait painting. This is, this is the basic set. I do have sort of like a more extended one, which has some bigger brushes that I use for varnishing or massing and things. Um, but this is just a collection of kind of like my most often used brushes um, when I'm painting. I do like rounds, um, the shape of the brush to be rounds. Generally, I do have some sort of flats and filberts and things, um, which just, you know, give you a little bit of variety. The main thing that I kind of want to show you here is I do have two sort of different um, uh, textures to the brush, right? So. Um, one of the main things that I'll use, I'll be using, is this uh, this golden synthetic. Okay, so this is a number ten. It's one of the larger brushes that I use. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a detail painter, and you'll see as as time goes on. But uh, I do tend to use more of the smaller brushes, like the zeros, twos, fours, things like that. But the the thing that I want to kind of show you here is that this is you know it's a softer brush, so it's a, a synthetic sable. It's a, it's you know mimicking a a, a soft sable hair brush. Um, at a lower cost, right? Sables are great if you, if you can get your hands on it. Um, but anyway, you can sort of feel the texture here. Um, and then you can contrast that with sort of a, a, a stiffer, um, stiffer textured brush. So this is a, what they call their ivory. This is a synthetic bristle. Um, and so it's just going to have a stiffer texture. 
Now, depending on um, how much paint you load into the brush, whether it's uh, the stiffer brush versus the softer one, you can make different marks. So it really, it just gives you some variety. It gives you another tool in your belt to create the effect that you're after. If, if you've got a stiffer brush and you're just not getting the paint to lie down, well, then we'll, we'll get a softer brush out and load more paint in it, and, and that should allow it to uh, stick to the canvas a little bit more easily. Um, and so then I've got a variety of sizes um, down, like I said, to this is, a, this is one of the smaller ones. This is a zero um, synthetic golden brush. Uh, that's a round. <clears throat> I do have one of these, what they call an evergreen in there. This is a filbert. Um, it's just kind of a nice, it's actually sort of somewhere in between in terms of texture. So it's a little softer than the, than the ivories, a little bit stiffer than the, um, the synthetic sables. Okay? So that's a really nice brush. I like that a lot. Um, but so we're just looking for the right size brush for the form that we're working on. So smaller forms like eyes and the nose, I'm going to need a smaller brush. Uh, for larger forms like the forehead and the, and the chest and things like that, especially the hair, I'll get, I'll get a larger brush out. Okay, so that's, that's the basic, basic idea for, for um, brushes. Uh, and you can, get this, you can get this whole set on their website, uh, Rosemary & Co. All right, let's move on to, um, to paints and setting up the palette. This is, a, uh, this is an Edge Pro Gear palette. Um, I really think it's a, it's a versatile tool. I use this as my palette in my studio. Um, I can, it's set up on a tripod here, any old camera tripod, and I can, I can change the angle, I can change the height, whether I'm sitting or standing, so it, it works out really well. Um, I use this for plein air painting because you can, you can um, attach your panel here to the front of the box, close it up like a laptop, and put it in a backpack, so it's, it's pretty nice. Um, I've got a, uh, a, a canister here that has my Gamsol in it, and it's pretty cool. They've got a little magnet um, epoxied in the bottom, and so it sticks here to this to this metal, uh, this metal tray, and uh, that saved me uh, a lot of trouble because I'm notorious for just, you know, knocking the the, terp the, uh, the Gamsol uh, in over and spilling it out all over my studio. Um, this is a palette cup that we'll use later, and uh, we'll talk about mediums in subsequent days uh, more in depth. But uh, let, let's talk about the, the colors that I'm using and how I have it set up. All right, so the first and most important uh, pigment that I use is uh, lead white. Now, um, I, you know, I use, whenever I can, uh, uh, the, the Rublev line of, um, of colors that's from a company called Natural Pigments. Uh, they just do a really good job of, of making high quality paints. They, they hand grind them. They, they grind them to different particle sizes, which has a certain way of affecting um, the way that the paint handles. So um, other, other makers like Winsor Newton or, or whatever, they're, they're grinding the particles smaller so that it has a certain kind of consistency um, uh, that's, that's sort of butterier. But, uh, so that's kind of, you know, goes a little bit further beyond sort of like the, the scope of this video. But for whatever, you know, take it for what it's worth that, um, you know, they do, a really nice, they do a really nice job. Now, this is their lead white number two. Um, so it's lead white that's been ground in walnut oil as opposed to linseed oil. And so the walnut oil is just a little bit, a little bit brighter um, uh, than the linseed oil, which, which tends to be just a touch darker, but uh, they're, they're both great. So I like the lead white number two. Now I have, I have put this in a, in a, different, a different tube. Um, one of the, uh, you know, their, their tenets of, of Rublev, one of their philosophies is they, they try not to put any additives into their, into their mixture, into their, into their paints, um, which most other companies do because they're looking for a longer shelf life. Shelf life. Well, Rublev is trying to get away from that because it, it has, you know, it, it does affect how the paint goes down, affects how it dries and things like that. Um, but one of the downsides of not putting any additives in it is that the oil can kind of separate um, and, the, and the, the paint can dry in the tube. So I've, I've had to kind of regrind this and then put it, in, put it into a different tube. But anyway, this is, uh, this is lead white number two. I'm go ahead and put that out here on the palette. Now I do have um, a titanium white as well. This is Michael Harding brand. Uh, I just like that. I, I'm going to use predominantly the lead white, but the, the titanium white uh, is just a, it's slightly brighter, slightly more opaque than the lead white, and so I can use that if I really need to kind of um, push for a higher value, maybe a little glint on um, a necklace or, or her eye or something like that. All right, so then we're going to, I'm going to, start laying out my yellows. You'll notice that I have my yellows 
and my reds grouped together and, and, and a hue family. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, hue and chroma in a second here. But so this is a, um, this is a lead tin yellow. So it's a, it's a, it's a very high value, sort of, you know, sort of highish chroma, high intensity uh, yellow. Then next I have a, a chrome yellow light from Rublev. Um, this is, you know, you could substitute this with cadmium yellow and get the same basic note that I'm looking for there on my palette. Next, I've got a Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre, again from um, Rublev. And then I've got, uh, the trans this is a transparent oxide yellow from Michael Harding. So it's an, it's an inherently transparent pigment um, based on how, f how small they've grind the particle, grind, ground the particles. Um, but it's a really nice kind of base mixture for shadows and things like that. Uh, to give it that sort of like transparent airy quality. And then the last yellow I've got here is a French umber. Now this is kind of equivalent to a raw umber that you might find in other brands. Um, but it is a yellow, so I group it with my yellows. Um, it's, it's a very neutral yellow, but it's, it's, not, it's not a red. So I think that it's really great to, to remember to put that here with your yellows. Uh, that'll make more sense practically when we get into the painting. Okay. Continuing on, I've got uh, this orange molybdate. Um, you could substitute that with, with cadmium orange and be just fine. It's basically a very high intensity um, uh, orange. I've got a uh, genuine vermilion, okay? And this is another one that I had to read too because this lasts a long time. Um, it's got a high tinting strength. Uh, this, is, this is a very expensive pigment because it is, it is genuine. It's, a, it's a, the old way of making, um, making vermilion. It's not... Uh, not, not a cadmium, uh, but again, you could substitute this with, with cadmium and, and, and get the same basic idea out of it. It has just a really nice, what I like about vermilion is it has a really nice uh, mixing quality when you put it with, with lead white or the lead tin yellow. It gets a very beautiful flesh tone. Uh, cadmiums can be, a, they're stronger, right, so they can be a little bit harder to control, um, but you know, you'd be just fine. I used cadmiums for years. All right, next thing I've got here is an alizarin crimson. So it's sort of a more purple. Um, violety red. And then next I've got uh, a magenta. This is from Michael Harding again. So Michael Harding and Rublev, they're both really great paint makers. They, they make them by hand um, and they have really, really um, uh, excellent pigment quality. So whenever you can get a chance to use them, I, I definitely recommend it. And then my last red here is a transparent oxide brown. So basically, you could substitute this with like a, like a red umber, a burnt umber. Um, just looking for a darker value, lower chroma, red, basically. Reddish brown. All right, so now let's jump over here uh, to the other side of the white. And um, I, like to, uh, I like to use viridian when I'm doing flesh painting. It just gets a really beautiful kind of coolish note. Great for things like veins under skin or like these sort of neutral tones that tend to be right here um, uh, near the corner of the eyes and the nasal bone. All right. And then I've got an ultramarine blue, so just a pretty standard, you know, beautiful deep blue color. Now it's possible since she's wearing a blue shirt, I may need a slightly higher value, higher chroma blue. So I've got this. This is just a, an old, old tube of, of blue that I've had in my, uh, my box for a long time. I think it's made by, by Lefranc. It's, um, uh, it's just a Lefranc blue, I guess is what they call it. You could, you could substitute this with like cobalt, a cobalt blue. All right, and then I do like to have a, a cobalt violet dark. Again, this is by Michael Harding. Uh, this will just give us some, some, uh, um, some ability to kind of mix sort of, uh, uh, I can, it can neutralize the yellows, I can use it to make my reds tip a little bit more into the violet direction. Um, so it's just nice to have it on a palette, not absolutely necessary. And then um, last, I've, I've got a, a Van Dyke brown. Now, I could probably put this with the, with the um, yellows or the reds, but I like to put that over here uh, to the side. Now, um, this is sort of just a warm, a warm brown. Um, 
you could, you could make this by mixing ivory black with the um, transparent oxide red or, and a little bit of the, the French umber and get the same, the same basic note. Um, if I want to later, I will actually pull out a little bit of an ivory black, and that'll just be a slightly darker, um, darker value note than this. Though the ivory black tends to tip more towards a bluish hue. And then just for the sake of um, for mixing it, sometimes I like to add this neutral gray by Michael Harding. It's just a, um, what they call value five uh, neutral gray. And so it's, just, it's good to just have there on the palette to mix with things. Okay, now the only other thing in terms of mediums today for the underpainting, um, I like to have a little bit of walnut oil. This is basically uh, any, any old standard walnut oil you can get in a bottle, but they just made it into a gel form. Uh, this is going to just, if, if the paint is too stiff and I want it to flow out a little bit more and be a little bit looser, uh, I can grab a little bit of the walnut oil. And then I do like to have uh, that oleo res gel again, okay? So this is basically linseed oil in a gel form mixed with a little alkyd resin. Uh, so it's going to hasten the drying time. I'll, you'll probably see me add that in with the darks of the hair and certain things that I want to remain glossy from day to day. It'll also... Um, uh, It'll also just keep those darks really nice and rich, okay? And, and so that's really, that's really it. We've got, we've got everything set up here, and um, let's jump in. All right, a few other things um, before we get started. Let's talk about, let's talk about the, the canvas, all right? Um, this is a uh, lead-primed uh, uh, Belgian linen that's got a very smooth texture. And it's actually been adhered to a panel. This is called an, uh, an ACM panel. So it's aluminum composite. And it's this whole panel is made by a company called uh, Artifacts. Uh, and this is called an all-in panel. So it's, uh, it's a really nice, it's a really nice um, uh, alternative to, to using canvas that's been stretched. Um, it, it's nice to paint on, but it also actually is really good for the, uh, the longevity of your picture. So that a lot of times when you see paint cracking, um, in museums over 100 years, it's, it's because uh, it's, been, it's, on a, it's on a stretch canvas. And, and as the humidity and temperature and things change uh, over the course of time, that causes the paint, that causes the paint to crack. But if, you, if I have a canvas adhered to a, what they call a rigid support like this is, then um, that's you know, much, uh, uh, much less likely to happen. So it's, um, it's a really good idea to, 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 um, uh, to look at to look at these guys. Now what I've done here is I've toned it. I've toned the canvas uh, to be sort of a neutral, a neutral gray. That was just the, uh, I did this several days, you know, several weeks beforehand, where it's, um, it's just that oleo res gel, a little bit of the Van Dyke brown, and some of the Gamsol, and I just took a paper towel, wiped it over the, or wiped it over the whole thing, let it dry. That's just to kind of kill, uh, to kill the white so that when I'm Going to apply color, it doesn't distract doesn't distract my eye. You know, you can definitely paint on on white a white ground if you like. Uh, I've seen people do dark red tones. It, you know, it's it's all up to you. Um, but that's what I've got here. I li I prefer the lighter. I prefer sort of a light neutral neutral tone to the canvas. And um, and then here I've got a mall stick that I'll be using. That's I'm going to use that to just sort of uh, rest my hand as I'm as I'm trying to make my marks. All right, let's. Uh, Let's dive in. So what we took from yesterday is we understand um, how values work, right? That there's two different phenomena with light, that there's form light and there's highlight. So form light being how perpendicular are the planes to our, to our light source. And the more perpendicular the plane is, then the brighter it is. Um, highlight has to do with my position in the room. It's the light actually ricocheting off of the surface of her flesh and entering my eye, okay? So they're two different things and they're, on, they're in two different locations on the portrait. So let's kind of put highlight aside for a second and let's just concentrate on, on form light. Now, if I take the forehead here, the plane that's most perpendicular to the light on the forehead is right here. Now, that's the highest value in terms of form light. And it's also gonna be the most colorful, okay? So the more perpendicular the plane is, the higher the value is, the higher the chroma is, that's the intensity, and then the hue we, we have to determine is, um, you know, it's either sort of a, a red-yellow, right? So we're, we're introducing two more variables to, um, to our thought process here. We've got good drawing, we've got good values, those are by far the most important, 
And now we need to talk about um, hue and chroma. So hue, very basically, is just, is it red, yellow, green, blue, or violet? Uh, chroma is how intense it, how intense is that, is that uh, color relative to neutral, right? So these, these yellows that I have on my palette over here to the left, these are very uh, high in chroma, right? So it's a very high in chrom high chrom highly chromatic yellow, whereas the uh, French umber is a low chroma, but still in the yellow family, okay? So then the, cad the orange molybdate or the cad orange and the vermilion, those are very high, high chroma colors. And then the um, transparent oxide brown is a low chroma red, right? So it's more neutral and it's also darker in value. Okay, so here we're gonna have, again, high value, high chroma, and now it's up to me to decide which hue it is. Flesh is always some sort of version of yellow-red. Uh, so I just kind of ask myself, is it more yellow or is it more red? I would say on the forehead, maybe it's just a touch more yellow um, than red. That doesn't mean it's only yellow, it's just maybe a little bit more yellow than red. And this is a uh, sort of classical convention that, that foreheads tend to be a little yellower the nose and eye region tend to be a bit more red. There's more capillaries in the cheeks and things. And then the kind of lower third, the mouth and chin, tend to be a little bit more neutral. Uh, you'll see that happen a little bit more, uh, obviously, on um, um, portraits of men where, where you know, if, there's, if they're shaved and you can see the stubble, that kind of uh, increases the, um, the sort of neutrally grayish tones in that region. All right, well, let's just, just jump in with, got a little lead white. And my paint's a little bit stiff here, so I'm going to grab some of the walnut oil just to kind of loosen that up. So lead white for the high value. And then I'm going to just grab a little bit of that um, chrome yellow and maybe a touch of the orange. And let's go up here and just kind of test it out. So again, this is, this is an underpainting. So I'm not looking for this to be perfect. It's kind of like the drawing. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm just going to start to get things down and set up relationships. Set the relationships up as well as I, I can. But knowing that I've got two more days of painting ahead of me, um, at least, that two more layers, that I can, um, I can make all the corrections that I need. All right. So that seems okay. One thing that I like to think about with underpainting is um, if I'm going to err on any uh, side, I like it to be a little bit lighter as opposed to darker. It's much easier to correct um, a, a value that's too light or a chroma that's too intense than it is to get a lighter value um, and a more intense color more chromatic color um, in later stages if I've gone too dark and too dull. Okay, so um, try to keep things high, high in value, high in chroma to begin with, and you can always dull that down later. But again, I'm just, I'm just assigning, I'm assigning values here, okay? It can't be overstated enough that, you know, reality is always going to be brighter and more colorful and more brilliant than anything that I can create here. Um, I've got more range at my disposal than I had in the drawing, but um, but it's still inferior to, to what I see in front of me. So I'm basically just mixing up the highest value, highest chroma thing that I can on my palette and, and placing it there. And then now we've got the highlight, which is situated just to the, to the right of that passage that I just painted. Um, so the highlight is higher, it, it certainly is higher in value, um, but it's lower in chroma. So I can, I can more or less just sort of push to white. So I'm adding a greater proportion of the lead white to my little puddle on the palette here. So it's gonna look funny for a little bit as we just sort of kind of lay things in and get a sense. Now, I probably do see a little bit more color up there than what I'm, what I'm currently putting down, but I know that if I keep that light um, and maybe more toward the neutral side, then um, uh, I can add more color to that later in, in subsequent passages. And you'll kind of see that. You know, this is kind of one of those things that you sort of have to know the end from the beginning. So once you see the whole process, you'll, these decisions will make a little bit more sense.
All right, so now we're back up here to form light. This is the highlights kind of covering this region, and this is form light. Now, this plane is slightly less um, perpendicular to the light than this plane. So I have to make it a little bit darker than whatever I've chosen there. So back to my puddle on my palette that's made up mostly of white, uh, chrome yellow, and the, the two chromatic uh, oranges and reds. And I just need to make something that's a little bit darker, a little bit less chromatic. So I'm grabbing some of the yellow ochre, a little bit more of the uh, vermilion. And it's still got to be even just a little bit darker, so more of that ochre maybe, a little bit more vermilion. You might have noticed I've kind of got like an older beat up brush. Um, I like to use those for the underpainting because I'm not really looking to make super precise marks, um, at least at this, at this stage. Gives it sort of a nice softness to the, the kind of beat up older brushes. So, um, so underpaintings. There's, there's a bunch of different ways uh, to make an underpainting. You could, you could do this in, in black and white. You could do this in grisaille. Um, you could, the, you know, uh, if you've ever heard of a verdaccio, that's kind of like doing a really green underpainting that I guess sometimes people like, artists like, because it, it plays off of the sort of reddish tones of the, of the flesh. And some of that will kind of like show through. Um, uh, again, this is sort of like a, 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 a process that I developed from what I could see the Bouguereau was doing. And he would just use a full palette. So this is basically a, you know, a full, I've, I've got all my colors out. I'm using, I'm using the full spectrum of my color space. Um, but it's basically just going to be kind of a, a, a very broad, general um, um, first pass over the, uh, over the whole picture. So we're just, we're just setting up relationships. We're getting the colors. Um, we are advancing the drawing, right? So, so long as I don't lose the drawing, there's really no way to mess this up. You know, so long as it, by the end of today, it sits in space, we've got some color. We've thought about the values a little bit more. We've kind of got a sense of how light and how dark things are going to be. Um, then we're going to be in a good spot. Okay. So I'm just kind of making, uh, making slightly darker, um, slightly more neutralized versions of this. Now it's kind of gotten a little bit yellow over here. And that was um, maybe not ab absolutely uh, intentional. Um, so I can kind of make that a little bit redder just by adding a little bit more vermilion into my, into my puddle. But in, mentally what I'm thinking about is I've got, I made my decision here, okay? That's, that's the most perpendicular plane. That tells me the most about the color uh, of her forehead. And then every other decision, even the highlight, is sort of a derivative of that decision, right? So the highlight's basically just a, a brighter, more neutral version of that. And these planes over here are basically darker, more neutralized versions of that, still in the same basic hue family, okay? So I'm continuing on, adding a little bit more raw umber. Can probably be a little bit more aggressive with the darker, the darker values at this point. I kind of mentioned uh, in the drawing that uh, the closer we get to the Terminator, right, so our shadows over here, the closer we get to the Terminator, the, the quicker uh, the value drops, okay, so the darker it gets. And so we've got this very broad wash of light, very high, high in value. Um, for, for a larger surface area, and the closer we get to the Terminator, um, we, uh, we find those darker notes, those darker tones. All right, so pretty rough. Doesn't really matter. Just getting something down. What I might do, what I might do at this point is start to treat the hairline. Okay, so as we move up here, it's a good idea to keep the hairline nice and soft. So it's getting darker, it gets a little bit more neutralized. Sometimes it actually tips a little bit to kind of like a greenish um, hue. 
in my head, I kind of explain that to myself as it's, it's sort of a, uh, you're seeing the hair follicles emerging from the scalp and, you know, from a distance it all kind of averages out. But maybe, maybe let's just jump in and put in some, some darks of the hair. So, cleaned off my brush, went right into, you know, cleaned it off with the uh, Gamsol. And I'm going to put in a little bit of that uh, oleo res gel just to kind of make that a little glossier. Uh, I pulled from the French umber, the transparent oxide brown, a bit of the uh, Van Dyke brown to get it a little darker. Just looking to kind of mass, mass something in. What, I, what I'm after here is I want to see how those things are looking uh, next to one another. It's all, it's all context. Okay, so there's no, there's no correct value. Um, there's just good, good relationships, good value relationships, good color relationships. All right, so it's, it's a brown, probably tips more, a little bit more yellower than, than red. But just kind of scrubbing this in. One other thing to keep in mind um, for underpaintings is you generally don't want that there to be a lot of medium in those under layers. Okay, it's this very simple kind of fat over lean principle that you want more oil in the upper layers and less oil in those under layers, so that the the first layers dry more quickly and the, and the upper layers dry more slowly. If the if the top layer dries faster than the bottom layer, then that's when you're going to get cracking or this kind of like shrinkage. Um, and uh, it looks like, it almost kind of look like, looks like blisters sometimes um, in, a, in a dried picture. So I've got very little medium, at least compared to what we're going to have um, going forward. As we move over here, it's a, the hair is a little bit lighter. So I was grabbing some of the yellow ochre, the transparent yellow. Just kind of dropping that in. Back to a clean brush, mostly the Van Dyke Brown, raw umber, transparent brown. Just sort of dropping that in here. I'm going to bring that right up to the edge of the forehead. I always think this is it's kind of funny where um, I'll, I'll start with the forehead or put the flesh mixture down and then um, it looks dark as I'm putting it down but then when I bring a darker value just just up next to it, it, all of a sudden it looks so much lighter. Um, okay, then now, mostly this transparent yellow is on the brush. I'm just going to use that to kind of fill in this, this shadow. So it's, it's sort of similar to what we were doing yesterday with flattening the shadows in graphite. Just sort of laying something in, but I'm, I'm purposely trying to make it flat, right? I want to set this up to help the modeling in the lights. I'm not too worried about um, all the variety that's in the shadows. So again, that's just predominantly the transparent yellow. As it gets down here, it does it does get lighter in value, get a little bit more chromatic because of the reflected light. So I grabbed a, a greater proportion of the uh, yellow ochre and kind of put that in there, but I don't know. This is just, just kind of massing something in. Doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be thought of as correct at this point. Okay. All right, so back to the 
back to the idea of kind of treating the hairline. I'm going to remix my sort of forehead starting value. So again, white, orange, uh, cat orange, orange molybdit, the um, vermilion. It's too dark, so a little bit more white, a little bit more of that yellow. So I do a lot of testing, you know, because it, it looks different down here on the palette, and it's, it's in its own context with with this neutral ground, um, this neutral palette. So by the time I get it up here, in, it, in the context of the picture, um, it looks totally, totally different. I'm gonna switch brushes just so that I can make sure it's nice and clean. Put out a new paper towel. Grab some more of that white. Looking to find that high value, high chrome again. Oof, the, uh, the orange is so strong. Maybe I'll add a little bit of the titanium in there. Again, that titanium is just a little bit more opaque, a little bit higher in value than the, um, than the lead. That's good and bad. I like, I like the way that, that lead generally mixes um, with the other colors and creates just more subtle um, flesh tones. But I used titanium exclusively for years. I have, I have in, in recent years learned that, that lead is actually better uh, for archival purposes. It's, it's more flexible as the, as the paint film ages so that um, you know, theoretically, all, if all other things were, were the same, it would, it would crack, lead white would crack less than, than a titanium-based picture. But, um, you know, there's all kinds of variables to consider. Anyway, just laying some of that in. Now it's getting darker. The planes are getting darker as I move here toward, toward the left contour. So... Just slightly though, just slightly. So it's going to get a little darker, a little more neutral. I could neutralize that by just kind of grabbing some of that shadow puddle that I have left over on the palette. I could neutralize it and darken it by grabbing the, um, the, the, just the perfect neutral five I have there. But this is just very, very general initial, initial lay-in. Okay, and so then now we're kind of ready to treat the hairline here. Really just sort of amounts to putting in an intermediate value between the hair and the, uh, and the forehead mixture. That got maybe a little too dark. So I'm really kind of just grabbing some of the some of the hair mixture right into the puddle of the forehead, and then it makes a value and tone that's sort of halfway in between. But again, if I wanted to maybe cool that off a little bit more, um, neutralize it, make it a little bit um, bluer. The viridian's a great a great mixture. And then that, the hair, just as it emerges from the scalp, catches a little bit of highlight, so it's pretty neutral. Just grabbed a little of the neutral to kind of put right in there. I don't know. Not too worried about it at this point. And notice I kind of grabbed a softer brush for a second just so that I could make a slightly smoother transition. But 
but now I'm back to sort of one of the stiffer brushes. Just looking at the shape of the forehead. Bringing some of the hair down over the top of that forehead. All right, and so now, now that I've surrounded that, that form, I can kind of see that these planes need to darken a little bit more. All right. And that's a good thing, because what I'm thinking about is this versus this. It's this value here versus the dark values that I place here that's, gonna, that's eventually going to make that that volume feel round. It's going if to, I, if I make things over here too light and if I make things over here too dark, then that, that whole thing is going to deflate. The illusion is going to deflate. So I'm, I'm thinking within the context of my picture. I'm thinking this versus this, not this versus that. Okay? It's really important. We're making an analogy here, right? We're not making a one for one copy. I'm going to keep trying to just say that again and again throughout this, throughout this process because it's, it's a really, it's a tough idea. It's like our default. We always just sort of default to wanting to match what we see um, and just forgetting that you, you can't do that, that it's just impossible because, because it's limited, because we're limited um, by, our, by our palette. So I'm kind of just treating the the transition from the highlight into the form light. You know, this is not nearly as uh, colorful. What I've mixed up here is not nearly as colorful as what I see. And so again, I know that I'm, I'm going to get there through the painting process. As we build up the paint um, in the next couple layers, we might be able to go back in today um, and hit that. But we're just starting to get some of that context in. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about it um, being exact. OK. so. Kind of moving down the forehead. These planes here are a little darker, a little less chromatic, a little bit more neutral than the planes up here. Maybe it's starting to tip a bit more into kind of like the pinker hues as opposed to the yellower ones on the top of the forehead. This value over here is kind of bugging me. It's a little bit too dark. Or I'm sorry, it's too light. I want to darken it. Now I can kind of bring the hair down. Soften that edge. Doesn't really matter. Just kind of taking a mental step back here and noticing that I had kind of left out the, the hair on the bun. So I'm just going to kind of scrub something in here. Um, it's a little bit lighter in value, so the hair itself is actually a little lighter, but it also is catching some more highlight. So I just went into the yellow ochre, transparent yellow. And then as it turns away from the light over here, it gets darker and more neutral. I don't know. I keep saying that because it's you know this is I really am just making guesses here at this point. I don't really know exactly where this is going to end up. I mean, I they're educated guesses. I'm, I'm they're they're not wildly off. The, you know, I'm thinking about hue. I'm thinking about value. I'm, I really am. I have those three variables in my head, and I'm. They can, they can be uh, analyzed independently of one another. So, okay, what value is it? Is it light or dark? Um, what hue is it? Is it more yellow? Is it more red? Is it more blue? Whatever. Um, and then is it chromatic or is it more neutral? And then so you kind of synthesize those, those things together. 
just sort of treating the edge here. Before too long, I'm probably actually going to scrub in a little bit of the light for the background, the white for the background, um, to help also with the just sort of contextual um, uh, effect, I guess. Um, all right, thinking about jumping into the to the eye here on the near side. I'm just trying to decide if I have the right brush. Kind of just wanted a. Uh, I just want sort of a medium-sized brush here. This is um, this is one of those ivories, but I'm going to go right into mostly that transparent, that transparent yellow. Look towards me just a little bit. Perfect. And just kind of start there. Maybe that's a little bit more chromatic than what I need. So I can, being that it's a yellow, I can I can neutralize that by adding a little bit of the violet. Um, purple being the complement of uh, yellow, you can neutralize by adding complements to anything. So you can neutralize a red with a green, you can neutralize a yellow with a violet, you can neutralize an orange with a blue. Um, and I will do that sometimes. I think whenever possible I do try to neutralize uh, a hue by staying within that hue family, right? So I could have easily just sort of neutralized that by adding more of the French umber, the raw umber, and maybe some of the Van Dyke brown, or even, of course, then just the neutral, the neutral itself. Now, the neutral has some white in it, so that's, gonna, that's going to affect the opacity, right? I want to try to keep the shadows uh, more transparent than the lights. That, you know, that's just sort of a painting convention. I like, I like aesthetically the way that that looks on a picture. Um, that's not something you absolutely need. You can make a, you can make a great painting um, that's perfectly opaque throughout. You can make a great painting that's sort of semi-transparent throughout. Um, so none of that totally matters. What matters is the values. What matters is the good drawing. So just laying in that shadow there. Then looking at the eyebrow, it kind of catches a little bit of light. There's this intermediate plane. Let me get a different brush here, a smaller brush. Intermediate plane here between the brow the shadow on the brow and the forehead. So just a little lighter. It's actually a little more neutral because I think what we're seeing is the individual hairs of the eyebrow catching a little bit of highlight, which is more neutral. And so it averages out from a distance to being kind of a more neutral, more neutral tone. And then into the forehead here. So we've got smaller forms than the forehead, and so I've got a smaller brush out to be able to make these transitions. You can kind of see here, I, I had already laid in a light, I, then I laid in my shadow, and so I can kind of now take um, a mixture that's somewhere in between start at the shadow side and just sort of like hatch into it to start to create create that gradation. You've got to be careful with this and, and controlled. You don't want to be just blending. You know, I want to be th thinking as much as I can um, like a sculptor. Um, okay. So just continuing on here with the brow. I want to just lay this in. It's pretty dark. It's a little lighter than the, uh, the shadow here on the eye socket, but it's still pretty dark. So, you know, remember, I'm, we're, we're compressing values all the time. We're compressing local, local contrasts, right? So I want, I'm compressing this together in favor of that larger global context that we're going to be setting up. I can just kind of bring that down. This is mostly raw umber, or the French umber. Put a little, little of the violet in there, just neutralizes it a little more. When you're, when you're trying to mix up something that's pretty neutral, um, you, you can get there by many paths, you know, so... Uh, in other words, you can, you can 
get there by adding a whole bunch of different pigments together. If you're, if you're looking for something that's chromatic and high in value, you really only can start with, with um, the purity of the white and the really chromatic colors like the, the uh, chrome yellow, the orange molybdate, and the vermilion. You've got to start there if you want to have something um, really, really intense. All right, just sort of stitching that together. Um, coming down here to the upper eyelid. So it's in the light. It's kind of a neutral value, um, or, you know, mid value. And it tips more toward pink, right? So I've grabbed a little bit more of that vermilion and orange mixing that with a little bit more white, but it's not competing really with anything going on up here. And then as that little uh, sliver of, you know, the conceptual sphere, as, that, as that's turning around, turning away from the light, it gets just a little darker and a little darker. So I'm painting, I, I like to paint pretty systematically, you know, so I'm, I'm moving along the form from, form, from form to form. And especially when you're learning, I think that's really helpful, rather than kind of dancing around, because you're looking to make really subtle adjustments. And usually if you just put a stroke here and a stroke there, then it, it misses something. You're, you're missing attaching to the volumes. And that's, you know, again, the, the, the mental, that's the mental space that you've got to be in. You've got to be... Uh, treating your painting like it's a sculpture. You're creating uh, its, its own little world back behind the picture plane. Here I'm grabbing a bit more of that uh, vermilion so that it's a little bit more apparent. Um, I, I really like to sort of push that, those, those cooler, bluer notes sort of right in this region. Um, near the tear duct and the nasal bone. And just kind of merge that with the shadow as that, as that plane tips away and then gets, gets caught by the cast shadow here from the brow. All right, so we're sort of surrounding the eye. I might as well just sort of jump in there uh, into the eye itself. And I like to just Take the Van Dyke Brown, a little bit of the, the Oleo Res gel just to make it a, a touch darker and glossier. And I'm going to go ahead and just kind of drop in a dark for the pupil. So now we've really kind of completed the value scale. Things are going to get darker uh, in subsequent passes and probably also a little bit lighter. But given the context of what I've set up today, I've gone from my lightest light being the, the, the highlight that's on her forehead um, now to the darkest dark, which is the pupil um, in her iris. And so it's the, it's the relationship of everything else between that that's going to create our illusion. But that's just an assigning. You know, the, her pupil is darker than what I've got here. It's designed to absorb light, right? And so I can be pretty confident that if I choose a really dark note, then it's not going to be out of, out of place or out of context. It, ma it makes sense, right? Now finding a little bit more color for the, for the iris. Sort of a, sort of it's a yellower brown, so grabbing more of that transparent, transparent oxide yellow a little bit of the uh, yellow ochre. But it's getting lighter in value over here in this lower right kind of quadrant of the, of the iris. That's where it's, again, it's most perpendicular to the light. So that's where we see the brighter values and the most color. All right, but I'm trying to I'm trying to keep that nice and nice and dark. If I if I take a kind of mental step back and I squint down just a little bit, 
all of the iris groups together uh, as a dark. Um, what I overwhelmingly will find with students when they try to paint the iris is they're really going to try to pop those contrasts and make the iris way too bright. Um, so let's, let's try to keep that, keep that value and everything grouping, grouping together. Let that, we'll, we'll, go, we'll be able to get all kinds of value and make it look brilliant and sparkly later. But right now, we're, we're just setting up the, the larger value context, okay? So now moving on here to the, you can see just a little kind of triangle uh, of the wide of the eye before we get to the corner of the eye. So it's a little darker than the iris, or I'm sorry, a little lighter than the iris, um, but very, very, very neutral. So basically the same for our purposes at this point. And then a little intermediate value for the edge of the upper eyelid. Trying to be very, very careful with the drawing here. You know, we don't want any stray marks that start to make the drawing drift unintentionally. It's worth repeating that the only way that I really can, can mess this up, this underpainting phase, is if, I, is if my drawing gets worse, if the drawing starts to drift. If I keep my drawing and the values are still kind of haywire and the chroma and hues are just a little bit off, you know, okay, that's fine. We can, we can work with that. But um, a drawing that gets worse, it just you're going to have to kind of put the brakes on and readdress, um, which I've had to do. Which I mean, that's okay. You know, it's still, it's still fixable, but um, you're definitely taking a step backwards rather than advancing the picture. Um, all right, so here looking at the down plane of the upper eyelid, I, I started introducing some, um, some redder notes. Uh, so I, I really basically just uh, put some oaths and crimson right into uh, the puddle and sort of in the neutral value. You can see like on my palette, there's just sort of this puddle that's kind of like growing in different, um, uh, in different growing with different arms or whatever. So I've kind of got the darker uh, hair and shadowy colors here. I've got the lighter. Um, more perpendicular planes, and then this is sort of this neutral mid-value ground that I can then just mix into. But here we've just got crimson for those redder notes at the tear duct. Palette organization is very important, though, you know, to try to um, keep track of what you're doing. The messier your palette gets in general, kind of, that's a a, uh, you know, a symbol for what's going on inside your head, you know. So if it gets messy, it's best to just kind of clean it off, start over, and, uh, and refresh. All right, the white of the eye is um, kind of a bluer hue. It's a mid-value, right? When I compare, I take that step back and I compare it to the highlight on her forehead, the, the white of the eye is not nearly as, not nearly as bright. Um, I think the f just by the fact that we call it the white of the eye, sometimes it, it tricks people into making it, you know, almost pure lead white, and just that contrast looks really silly. So I just grabbed a little bit of blue, more of that lead white, right into, right into the puddle that's on my palette. Just kind of taking a guess here. Comparing it to the forehead in my picture, making sure this is many times brighter. And it's a little darker as it approaches the, the upper eyelid. It actually gets a little bit pinker then. The white of the eye gets a little pinker as it approaches the, the tear duct. So there's a little gradation that's happening there. You know, everything's gradating. We need to just keep keep working on um, all of those gradations rather than like, you know, I'm not going to lay one stroke over the entire upper eyelid and make it the same value. Now looking at the, the down plane of the lower lid, it's certainly, certainly more red uh, in a red hue family more than anything else. Um, I did add a little bit of that yellow ochre. Um, Kind of tip it back more toward the yellows, so it's a, you know, it's a yellow, it's a yellowish red, but predominantly more red. 
And then it gets a little darker, a little more neutral as we move toward the right and approaching the, the corner of the eye. I can kind of just maybe bring that up for the upward facing plane of the lower eyelid. That's catching a little bit of light right there. Maybe, maybe I'll trip, I'll switch to a softer brush. And if I load it with, you know, a decent amount of paint, it'll create a nice sharp point. What I want is a darker kind of reddish note here for the, the crevice shadow with the fold of the upper eyelid. And maybe make that a little darker. So we kind of come around here. It's a little bit too red. So I can neutralize that. I could grab some green and grab some of the Van Dyke brown. Pushing those values darker. Still got my trusty mirror. Let's have a look here. All right. It's looking okay. We're doing our we're doing the process. You gotta trust the process and just move bit by bit. So let's move down to the cheek. Why not? Now, I generally like to paint light to dark. Um, I know plenty of painters who will paint from dark to light. So whatever suits you. I think uh, I find the lights to be more limiting. You know, So that's the thing that I can compete with less relative to reality. So if I start there, then I kind of know how, you know, how to key everything else relative to it. Um, in my experience, when I painted from, from dark toward the light, I'll often go too light here, and then I'll run out of room for it to be um, high in value and high in chroma in, in these regions. So, but you know, if you can, if that works for you, then, then do it by all means. So here I'm looking for, uh, you know, pinker hues. Definitely the cheeks are, are pinker than the forehead. Um, and this is the darker side of the face than that. So I'm, I need to make sure that I reserve some, val some liar values for over there. So that's, this has just been white. I'm going to grab a little of the walnut oil to make that flow a little more. And vermilion. Maybe a little bit more of the ochre. All right, but then that's neutralizing pretty quickly as it turns away and moves up on the cheekbone. So I grabbed some viridian, French umber. Maybe a little bit more of the ochre. A little more French umber, a little bit of Van Dyke brown. As I'm just trying to darken and neutralize the, that basic starting point and turn this, turn this cheek. Tip it away from the light. Maybe even Maybe even a little more. So the paint factor here is still pretty thin. You know, I can still see a good bit of the, you know, the canvas peeking through in spots. So we'll, the painting will become more opaque tomorrow. In that, in that second pass. The lights will get lighter, the darks are going to get darker. And that's really going to be where we, where we go for it, where we really go for the, the finished effect that we're after leaving the, the final 
pass or the, ref the refining and polishing and just getting these beautiful subtle effects with glazes and things. But um, so this is like, you know, this is like the setup. But keeping it thin relatively. You know, while I've got that kind of on the brush, I can kind of just bring this all the way down the length of the face. It's, this is basically all the same plane relative to the light source, and so it's going to be basically the same value. There might be some hue shifts and things, but that's all extremely subtle, um, and a lot's going to change by the time we get to that level of subtlety. So I think it makes sense to just sort of bring that all the way down. All right, now back up to sort of the lighter passages in this cheek here. So white, um, orange, a little vermilion. Maybe that's too colorful, so a bit more white to bring it up higher in value, and the white will also neutralize it. Now, as these, the planes are turning away from the light, um, rolling into the side plane of the nose, it's getting darker again. A little bit more neutral there. Are, I mean, there definitely are some sort of chromatic reds in there where we get some shadow. There's probably, um, you know, there's more capillaries in the skin. Um, it's, you know, maybe there's just the, the skin tone itself on the nose can often be just a little bit more chromatic, right? So there are local color changes. You know, the skin is not a perfectly homogenous um, hue throughout. But I always like to try to explain things to myself. I'm trying to understand what I'm seeing, why would it be like that? Um, because it's so easy to get tricked. It's so easy to, to you know, think you see something um, and it's not and it's not actually there. Um, there's also this idea of simultaneous contrast. So it's this our brain is interpreting the world, right? It's not it's not as if it's this completely uh, impartial uh, machine that that's just feeding us data. It's actually it's interpreting what we see, right? Um, and so this idea of simultaneous contrast happens in our brain. It's when you have when you have a, a dark thing adjacent to a light thing, the contrast actually looks greater than what it actually is. Um, or for instance, so like the, this nostril that's catching some light, it's surrounded by a whole bunch of uh, dark things, dark shadows on the nose. So it, it might trick my brain into thinking that it's lighter than it actually is, but I know I have to kind of counteract that with my knowledge. I know that the plane of that nostril is tipping really far away from the light in this direction in the room, and so therefore I need to make it dark, okay? So you always want to be, always want to be thinking, always want to be just sort of having a conversation in your head about uh, um, just really basically the physics of light and like what, what, how is that happening and, and um, how could I explain that to myself and, and, and make the best decision possible at this, at this stage. So I'm just going to lay in this shadow now here as I've kind of started working my way into the, the nose. Um, it's not a very dark shadow. It's open to a lot of reflected light. And it's definitely redder, so I could add more vermilion, I could add more crimson. Crimson might be a good choice because that, that maintains some transparency. But again, I'm just going to go ahead and flatten all that out. It, it gets a little lighter, maybe a little bit more yellow as we move toward the left because there's more reflected light over here on this side to fill this shadow. So I can kind of set up a little gradation. I've basically just gone over the, 
the shadows of the nostrils themselves and in favor of just unifying that whole thing. So then again, let's just take a you know, quarter step up in value from the shadow and lay in the nostril. Maybe it's a little bit more colorful than that, but I don't know, it doesn't matter too much. All right, so, so let's approach the nose the same way that we did the forehead. It's just another version um, of, a, of that sphere, that conceptual sphere in our head. Um, but it's going to go through all of the same basic planes as what we did up here. So I'm going to start with the plane that's most perpendicular to the light, just above and to the left of the highlight. The highlight's going to be here. But so this plane is the highest in value and the most chromatic. And it's pinker than the forehead. So I'm going to grab the lead white, maybe just a touch of the titanium for that added just um, higher value and right into the, uh, the orange. When you mix orange with white, it kind of tips pink. So it's a nice, nice little mixture here. I'm going to grab a little bit more yellow just to sort of make that a little bit, uh, a little bit less pink. And I can just bring that, that same basic value all the way up uh, the ridge of the nose. I think that's, that could probably be lighter in value and more neutral. And so titanium will do both of those things. By adding titanium to the mixer, mixture, it both gets higher in value and it gets more neutralized. But again, I feel like I'm seeing a little bit more yellow. All right, now we've got the highlight just to the right of that, so I'm going to just go into lead white, a little walnut oil just so that it flows a little more, and then kind of lay that on. Maybe a little more. Okay, so back to kind of our starting nose value, kind of a high value, relatively high chroma pink. And then as it turns away, it's getting darker and lower in chroma. So I can grab the yellow ochre, a greater proportion of vermilion, and then place that right here. Maybe into the raw umber to neutralize it a bit more. Just getting darker, lower in value, lower in chroma. And then it starts to merge with the, with the shadow. So I'm going to go back to a smaller brush that, or, or brush that makes a finer point because these, these planes, these transitions start to happen more quickly again right there near the terminator. So this is where most of the value change happens. So you see that arc from high value, high chroma, aiming toward the shadow, darker and more neutralized. If you go in this direction, then it's just the same. But I'm, the point is I'm aiming for this plane, right? Not the highlight, I'm aiming for this plane. Working that transition here out of the shadow on the nose. Just a little lighter here. A little more chromatic. And so you can see how just, you know, very simply that, that relationship starts to create that 
that illusion of volume. And uh, it's not the right shape yet. It's not exactly the, the right nose, but you know, we've, we've taken a step, a step forward where this is, this is taking, um, taking on that illusion. And now I'm just going to kind of bring those values up the side of the ridge of the nose, somewhere halfway between this value and the shadow. Maybe it could be a little bit brighter. It feels like the edge of the nose is kind of just sliced off there. I want to tip this back more toward the light. But see, I made that decision because I was experiencing like, the volume, the shape of the nose that I had created, and I was comparing it versus the shape of her nose, the volume of her nose. I wasn't, I wasn't comparing the values, if that makes sense. Right, so the value that I'm placing here is because it, I, I've decided on this value because it's in between those two and, because, and it results in a certain experience of volume, not because I'm saying, okay, what, you know, this versus that on the nose. It's very, very important. Seems like it's just a little lighter right in here where the nasal bone sits underneath. All right, before I move on in the nose, I'm just going to kind of refine this a little bit. I think I can lay in the kind of darks for the, the nostril themselves. And I like to, rather than going for like a brown or a black, uh, I like to see if I can push some color in there because I do think there is a lot of light and color um, happening. So I, I basically went to crimson and, uh, and Van Dyke brown. Now, especially, I think that can be seen on the nostril on this side. So there's a lot of light just passing through there. It's like, uh, that's called transmitted light, where the light is passing through the skin. Uh, it's kind of getting filtered out, and then it comes out, you know, the other side, uh, uh, redder and actually pretty chromatic. You know, it's like when you, it's when you hold your, your hand over like a flashlight and, you know, your, your, your fingers glow orange. Uh, it's the same, same sort of effect, obviously, I'm like, on a much more subtle scale, but um, I think that these these sorts of ideas and distinctions are what uh, can make the painting feel feel alive. Like there's blood flowing through the um, flowing through the skin. Thank you.
If you've learned only one path to developing your art, you may be limiting your own problem-solving skills. You can't do what you don't know how to do. This is why it's so important to study under different artists and instructors. You must learn multiple methods to navigate the unexpected difficulties any painting might throw at you. The risk of not having alternative problem-solving methods is perilous. You could be nearly finished with a grand painting and find yourself unable to go any further. Maybe you've experienced this already. With new insights, you'll see different paths and have multiple ways of dealing with issues that come up as you start and progress through a painting. In classical portraits, artist Joshua LaRock will show you his proven methods to investigate issues. Think clearly through each option and decide on the best way to proceed. Never again will you be held up because you don't know how to get past the problems you encounter while developing your painting. It's a simple question, but it's more than just good drawing, it's more than just getting a likeness, you know. If we get this right, um, we translate something of our sitter's personality, something of their humanity and their essence, so um, it's kind of elusive, but it's really, really satisfying, really, really challenging. Josh is recognized as one of the preeminent figurative artists living today. His paintings are rooted in classical techniques, yet filtered through a contemporary sensibility. I'm really influenced by, uh, by William Bouguereau. He's a 19th century French academic painter. And so what I'm gonna be showing you here is more or less um, what I've gleaned from his processes. More than the method or the process or the materials, specific materials that I'm using, I want you guys to be able to take away some, some problem solving tools that you can use in your studio to do self learning. Um, and hopefully kind of dispel a lot of the confusion. He combines the best of age-old techniques with a positive, modern approach to his subject matter. Josh's tried-and-true solutions will be a new and refreshing approach as he encourages you, especially while you're learning to break things down into components rather than tackle everything at once. Now you have the opportunity to learn to achieve these great results for yourself. Available on both DVD and digital format to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order Classical Portraits with Joshua LaRock today. Well, that just happened to be a segment from Classical Portraiture from Joshua LaRock one of our best-selling videos, and you can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get to know Joshua a little bit. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur, and welcome to Interviews with the Artist. Today I have Josh LaRock in the studio with us. Josh, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm really thrilled to have you because you're such an accomplished painter and, and doing so many wonderful things in the art world, so welcome. I appreciate it, yeah. I'm glad to be here and glad to be uh, working with you guys, yeah. So how did this whole thing happen? You, you fell in love with art at a young age? What happened? You're a pretty young guy. Um, yeah, well, maybe I can, can't say that for too much longer, but um, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I mean, my, my, dad, my dad drew and paint painted as, as I was growing up. Um, you know, he was a hobbyist and things like that. So I had it around and I kind of just thought it was something that was sort of normal. Um, I think some of my earliest influences was Bob Ross. You know, I would love to come home and watch him um, on the, uh, you know, on, on PBS after school. But um, yeah, I don't think I really knew that this was, this was like the passion of my life, that this was where I was going to take my career uh, for a long time. I was doing music for a long time in high school and college. And What kind of music? Well, I started off, I was, a, I was a percussionist, and then I was a drummer, and then I picked up the guitar, and I thought I was going to go in a jazz direction for a little bit, and then I did music business, once I kind of realized I wasn't going to be a performer. Um, now, what, why was that? Did you just feel you weren't talented yeah. enough? No, I don't know. I just don't think it was, it was me. Yeah. You know, I just don't think that, that was, I, was a, I was a performer at heart, that I wanted to spend that much time in the practice rooms or go on tour or things like that. Loved music, and that was why I had, I had picked it up. But um, yeah, anyway, so m 
my path was was a winding one to to find my way into art. It wasn't until, not unusual. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I think it's a very common story when I talk to other colleagues and things. So what what I'm curious about is that typically in let's say the teenage years, yeah. um, we tend to rebel against what our parents are into. Did you find yourself doing that at all? You know, saying you know I don't want to do what Dad's doing. Um. I don't. I don't know if it was rebellious. I think, I think I had it in my head that I was. I was. I was going to make sure I loved what I did with mm -hmm. my life. You know. I think I saw a lot of people around me. I don't know if it was necessarily my parents or anything, but I just think that it was a common experience to find people who didn't love what they got to go do every day at work, mm -hmm. and I just. I didn't want to do, be that. You know. So I was. I was trying to find something that I felt was meaningful, that I was passionate about something that I felt like had a, you know, a, great, a grand purpose for culture, whatever. You know, I, I tended to be pretty idealistic. Mm -hmm. So I don't, know if the, I don't think it was rebellion so much that was driving me, but just sort of this like, you know, bright-eyed idealism that, that I was chasing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so what happened then? Um, you mean after music business? Yeah. So I was... You went to college for music business? I did, yeah. So I got my degree in music business. Where? Uh, University of Colorado. Okay. Um, and... So I was in, I did a lot of interning because there's you know music business is a broad field and so I could do record producing or concert promotion or uh, radio or whatever so I was interning at a bunch of different places and I found myself uh, in Charlottesville Virginia I was I was working for um, the management company that the Dave Matthews Band um, his his manager had founded and and they also had a record record label as well so there were kind of a bunch of things I could. I could do there, but I was working for the management side of it, the artist management side, and that would actually have been a, a decent, a decent career path mm -hmm. um, within the industry, and particularly at that time because that was right when nobody knew how to make money selling records anymore because Napster had kind of like blown everything up. Right. Um, anyway, I, so I was in I was in Virginia, and I I was just kind of getting this feeling that this isn't this isn't the thing that I'm passionate about. You know, going back to is this going to be something that I'm going to be happy doing for the rest of my life. So um, around that time, I had been starting to find uh, artists that were really inspiring to me. I th Sargent was one of those, one of the very first, mm -hmm. who I was finding websites that were dedicated to him on, online. And so I just was eating up everything that I could about his life and about how he studied and, um, and what that was like. And so I, I came across that he had studied at an atelier, you mm -hmm. know, the French word for studio, with, for... Um, under Carolus Duran in the 19th century in France. And I didn't know what Atelier was at the time, so I just Googled it, I typed it in there, and that brought me to the Art Renewal Center and their list of approved ateliers. Mm -hmm. And so then I just started finding out about, you know, there, there were all these you know, small schools across the country, and there were several in Italy that were teaching artists. Uh, you know, so this was, this was all a revelation to me. And um, so, I, so I was, since I was on the East Coast, I decided, all right, I'm going to visit three that are, you know, some sort of close proximity to me and then kind of see where it goes. So uh, I went up to New York to visit Jacob Collins' school, the Water Street Atelier. I visited um, Nelson Shank's school, Studio in Caminati, and then Jeffrey Mims, who is, in, um, who is in North Carolina. And New York is New York, so that kind of won me over. I had been there a couple times before in college. and. And so I decided I'm just going to move there and, and see where it goes. You know, you probably don't realize how lucky you are. Oh, yeah. And, and what I mean by that is uh, when we started Fine Art Connoisseur, there were maybe three ateliers yeah. in, in the world, maybe four. And, of course, there was no Internet. And people who wanted to learn to right. paint this kind of art First off, didn't know anybody was doing it anymore. It didn't exist in the in the public eye, and what a typical art student would do is go to a either an art school mm -hmm. or to a college with an art program, and they didn't do this kind of art anymore. They weren't teaching figurative drawing anymore. Mm -hmm. They weren't they weren't teaching the classics. So your timing, I mean, e even Art Renewal Center didn't exist, and so your timing was perfect in mm -hmm. terms of coming in at this time when the perfect storm of the internet and art renewal center and some ateliers starting. Of course, now there's so many more ateliers than 
than there had been. Oh, it's growing like crazy. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, uh, it's really neat to see. I mean, just in the last 10 years um, since, I mean, I'm, I moved to New York in 2006. And, but you're right. I mean, I, I completely believe it. And I'm, I've talked to artists who are just, you know, half a generation uh, ahead of me. And just the lack of resources and the ability to find their way into like-minded schools and situations and things. I mean, I had felt some of that, you know, going to school. I, I had, in college, I did think about art at one point, but I, I walked into the art department and uh, I, I could just tell it wasn't technical. There wasn't going to be any technical kind of instruction. I don't think I knew what I wanted. I didn't know enough right. to know what I wanted. I just knew it wasn't that. But, right. um, but you're right. I mean, so once I did find out about it, then there were resources and there were ways for me to get access to it. Um, so, yeah. so you ended up going to school at uh, Grand Central uh, with Jacob Collins? Yeah, well, so that's what it became. When I, when I showed up, uh, he was still running a smaller... Water Street. Water Street, what, right. what, what, what was known as Water Street. Um, though it wasn't in Brooklyn, it was in um, 69th Street in Manhattan mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in his personal studio. I was there at that time. I don't, oh, right. You may have been there at the same time. Who knows? Yeah. There were a lot of students there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that was a really cool environment. But then he started the Grand Central Atelier uh, shortly after I had arrived, and then and then eventually merged, merged the two schools. So, help everybody understand what that atelier experience is like. Yeah. Uh, because I think that's important to understand the the foundational principles of training. Okay. What did they put you through? Well, I mean, so it's it's all practical based. Um, study you know so you're you you show up and the first year uh, at least the time was all drawing so we started drawing in graphite on white paper from the plaster cast and so this was just this beginning place to try to start figuring out how to draw accurately and how to create the the illusion of three dimensions um, did they do any bark drawings not my not at the time when I studied but they do now yeah I see. right so that's even like one step you know, prior to cast, so you're you're copying two dimensions to two dimensions in, in, in sort of a barred situation, and trying to kind of learn through, um, you know, osmosis almost like the the taste of of these 19th century masters. You know, for the people who are watching that might not know what Barg is, sure. could you explain that? Yeah, so Barg, Charles Barg, um, he studied with uh, Jerome in mm -hmm. the 19th century and was an amazing painter in his own right, but. Jerome had this idea to put together this drawing course, basically, that was a, a series of lithographs that were themselves mostly cast drawings, right? So they were, they were small drawings of eyes and noses and mouths and full busts of heads and things from the antique, you know, so Greek and Roman statuary and things like that. And then there was part of the book is also uh, figure drawing, you know, figure drawing sketches and, and things like that. So the idea was is that these lithographs could be reproduced um, you know, in the latter half of the 19th century and, and widely distributed so that people had access to, you know, good drawing and painting instruction. Um, and so people are still using that now. They're rediscovering this. They put together a great book. Um, I think it was Ackerman who put together the Barg book now mm -hmm. that we have, which is a compilation of these, these plates. And so we can use these just as, as a way to, um, you know, learn how, how, how these artists are thinking. And how do I how do I draw accurately? How do mm -hmm. I get good proportion? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the you you though started out with cast drawing, right? Uh, which probably was pretty difficult as a first time drawing experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not easy, and it's it's definitely a challenge to spend weeks on a drawing. Yeah. You know, um, when you're so, not well, used that's, to that. That's idea. got got to be the toughest thing is developing the patience. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, there's certainly one thing you need to be an artist, and that's patience, I yeah. think. Um, and, uh, you know, because so much of it's an art of subtlety, really, when it comes down to it. And so you've just got to take that time to observe and be able to, you know, make these, these very minor adjustments. So I think that's what I learned uh, with cast drawing. And, and, but you do a series of them. And so that was what was really helpful, I think, about the, the program of study, the, the curriculum, as loose a term as that, you know, the curriculum is you know, I think maybe overselling it. It was this basic idea that you were going to just start simply, you know, do one cast drawing, do just a mouth, right, of, of Michelangelo's David, do just the eye of Michelangelo's David. And then so you do a couple of them, you'll do a slightly harder one the second time. You'll, learn, you'll have gone through the whole process, you'll learn a little bit more, and then you'll get a little bit better at it. And then you would, so you would take the, what you learned in cast drawing and graphite, and then you would apply that to cast painting. So now you're trying to paint the cast, Mm -hmm. And um, 
but now you're, you're grappling with, with handling your medium. But it's all in right. black and white. Now, are they, are, are they giving you a lot of instruction along the way in terms of how to handle things, or are they letting you kind of discover it on your own? Well, I think now, now it's a lot, there's a lot more instruction um, mm -hmm. at, at the at Grand Central Atelier. There's a lot more consistent instruction days per week. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the time, Jacob would come by uh, every now and again um, as he had time, because he was working as an artist. That was, I think, kind of like the main thing that was uh, pretty unique about that situation, is being able to see him do his own work mm -hmm. um, in, in that environment. But then he had, he had former students come in, and they would teach us and mm -hmm. give us... Um, feedback and, right. and paint on the painting and show us how to do it a little better and but you know slowly over the time you just start to it starts to click right yeah right so the importance of this this foundation of drawing though mm -hmm. is is absolutely critical oh, and yeah. and the the tendency for people is to want to kind of fast forward to the meat uh -huh. and potatoes right away what is your best argument for really taking the time and learning the drawing? There's just no way around it. I mean, I think that's the, I say that every, every time I give a workshop. Um, you know, most of the time, I think people are coming to the workshops, they're interested in, you know, figuring out how I'm using glazing and scumbling techniques. They're, they have all these questions about the mediums that I'm using and the particular colors on the palette. And I always say that, I mean, you know, the magic is not there. The magic is not in those mediums. It's... Everybody, you know, across the board needs help with drawing, and particularly when it comes to portrait painting. I mean, it's obviously it's uh, paramount with landscape, still life, any any of the disciplines or, or genres. But particularly with a portrait, you you've got to draw accurately mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to get expression and likeness, mm -hmm. um, because the the you can make it look like a person vaguely, but getting it to look like that person and getting it to have some sort of their essence and their personality. Um, might go beyond drawing, like there's something more than drawing, but if not less. Does that make sense? You know what yeah. I mean? So you're not going to be able to get that if you, if you, haven't, if you haven't drawn accurately. So. You know, I think that, that you're, you're right, this, this idea of mediums and art materials and brushes, um, I, I equate it to uh, buying better golf clubs is going to make you a better <laughs> yeah, golfer. You true, know, it's, right. it's, it has nothing to do with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe there's going to be a subtle difference between, you know, product A and product B. But it really is about that foundational learning. For sure, yeah. Um, I, I always like to quote uh, Ang, the 19th century you know, French painter again. And he would, just, he would say that you know, painting is 90% drawing. It's, mm -hmm. all, it's all there but the color. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's so true. You know? And people really need to try to take that to heart. So you go from um, your, your drawing into painting. And mm -hmm. then what, what happened next? Are you talking about in, 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 in the school? In the yeah. studying. Yeah, so um, so you take you take drawing and graphite, then you pa take painting and grisaille, which is just black and white, mm -hmm. painting the cast, and then all the while you're drawing and painting from the figure, right? So um, concurrently, so you're doing kind of like half a day in cast drawing, uh, half a day figure drawing. So even in, in year one, they started you out painting or drawing. That's what it was. Figure. That's what it. There's there, I think there's some variations on that uh, in the yeah. current the current course, but um, yeah, that's the basic idea. So. Uh, and then you're taking, you're painting the figure in Grisaille, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so everything's just getting a little bit, little bit harder. But you're you're not having to juggle everything at once. Right? Yeah, because the minute you throw color into the mix, it just complicates everything, right? Uh, well, so, the variables uh, grow yeah. exponentially. Yeah. yeah. So learn, learning your values, learning uh, in the Grisaille, learning your values being your darks to lights. Yeah. Learning that, um, that. You're stacking things, right? Mm -hmm. Drawing. And now you're thinking about drawing. Now you're thinking about dark to light, about values exactly. and shadow. And while well, you're doing that, I guess, in drawing too. Mm -hmm. And then what was the next step? So then, so then, once you felt proficient at that, then you would paint in full color. So, um, so then, it, the so the last yearish of of my studies was just doing two a day, where, where I. In the morning, you're drawing, in, or excuse me, you're painting in full color from the from the figure. In the afternoon, you're painting in full color from the figure. And these were, but these were still long poses. So these were about four week poses. Mm -hmm. And so you do you do two each month. And um, so then it was just trying to put everything together, you know. How, and then and at some point, how do you start making works of art? They're figure studies, you know what I mean? They're 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 academic figure studies. Uh, but how do you then start to transcend that? And, there were some workshops along the way where we did still lives, so 
that's that's a little bit more about how do I make a picture, you know. Well, that's always the difficult part is is that transition point. It is um, you know I, I was reading Ives Gamble last night uh -huh. and Gamble talks about that you have to get to the point where you know that technology is second nature, the mm. the technology of painting so that you can express yourself right. by under you know knowing what to do. Right. But then how do you learn? how to make it a picture and, uh, or, or to express the emotions of the person you're painting. How, how do you make that leap? Is mm. that something they teach you in the school or is that something you have to kind of learn on your own afterwards? Yeah, it wasn't, at the time for me, it wasn't something that we talked about a ton. I mean, we would, we would discuss it, um, but it was, it was really a lot more technically based and uh, just trying to, the, the main project was sort of just continuing to recover this skill and get it out to more people. Um, that's a difficult, I mean, it's, it's a tough thing to figure out how to articulate, really. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you make a good composition? How do you, it, it's kind of like trying to describe how, how to be a good poet, you know? I mean, right. you, can, you can learn grammar and you can learn the, tech, you know, the, the aspects. That's of a the, great analogy. Yeah, but what is that? Right. I don't, you know. Right. But you know a good po poem. When, I mean, I, I think it's not completely, you know, nebulous and, and, and totally subjective. Uh, so I think there are, there are ways to understand how to make a good composition, how to think about color harmony, um, how to think about the emotional hook of a picture. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think this this exists somewhere in you know a different realm. If you were inventing the ultimate school, mm. knowing what you know now with um, several years, what how many years since you graduated? Uh, ten. Ten years. So a decade of experience on mm. your own, um, as an artist, you've had to figure a lot of things out. Sure. If, if you could redesign the atelier system mm. or, or your own school, what would you add, what would you subtract, what's been missing? And this isn't being critical of yeah, anyone. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. I mean, I've, I've thought about it, you know, a good deal. I, I, I mean, I just, I felt very fortunate to, to have found that study, it, it really made a lot of sense to me, mm -hmm. and the pace of it—it was—it was, it was self-paced, so uh, you know you were able to uh, take it as you needed, and I think that that was very valuable. Um, I do think that there's kind of this need now, maybe for more of like a postgraduate sort of thing, where so you take you take what's essential out of the technical side of things, and just how do you, how do you draw and paint well. Um, but then how does somebody learn how to be an artist? So if they could be in a, in a working studio, in a working mm -hmm. artist's studio, and learning aspects of the business, how do, you, how do you make a living at this? How do you juggle all the hats that you have to put on? That's a huge aspect of it. But then, but then more so, how do you also now make work, works of art? So that maybe there's this sort of like in-between space, you know, where yeah. they're where this is, a, this is a very skilled person who's come out of the, the academic study. There's a, a system in Russia. Uh -huh. Of course, Russia has some of the best training in the world. Oh, sure. And um, the very best of the best students then are brought into a postgraduate program mm. for, I think it's for three or five years. All of their expenses are paid. Their studio is provided for them. And they're told, That's this great. is the one time in your life while you're young, while you're energetic, you're going to be able to essentially get out there and do monumental mm. paintings. We want you to do big multi-figure paintings um, where you don't have any pressure of making a living. Mm. And this was created by a couple of brothers who fund this because they wanted to take the, the best of the best and help them get to those, those points that you talked about. How do you become an artist? How do you take it to the next level? Well, that sounds ideal. I mean, it's particularly the part about having some funding behind you, so that you have a, you have time to not just you know go out there and try to you know sell something right away. You have some time to take these things and figure out how to, uh, you know, realize your vision and, and figure out who you are as an artist. Well, as as you know, I teach art marketing, and and one of the things that I I have been saying to all the schools is, we need art marketing discussed in the schools sure. because you take. Uh, a young student, uh, pull them out of school, and all of a sudden they have that expectation of, mm. I've got to make a living. 
Now, I will say that where you come out of school matters. Uh, the training that you've received matters because there are, for instance, some galleries that will instantly grab people out of certain schools mm -hmm. because they know they're going to be good. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to make a living. Right. And to be able to prepare the soil, so to speak, plant those seeds, teach them how to do the marketing, I think would be something that should be part of the curric curriculum of all art schools, quite frankly. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, no question. So they're going to have to learn it at some point. Yeah. I you mean, you, got, you, so you, have to, you, have to, you have to know how to run your business. And, and, and this, by the way, is, is a problem in medical schools, mm -hmm. you know, that they, they graduate and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, by the way, you're in business. Yeah. All of a sudden you're hiring people and dealing with insurance and accounting and, yeah. you know, things that we don't want to have to deal with. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I mean, um, what's your best idea for, uh, for getting those and getting some sort of curriculum into those programs? Do you have... Uh, probably the best I idea would just be um, recording something and make it an online program that's, uh. that they all have access to because uh, for them to the the cost of trying to put that into their curriculums mm -hmm. especially you know you've got uh, 100 schools around the country or around the world now I think you know to, to be able to have some kind of a uh, a place that they can just go to and get that is probably makes the most sense makes sense to me there's an idea <laughs> um, so may, maybe something that'll get done one day. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of ideas out there. So, you um, you graduated from uh, Jacob's School, right? And now you find yourself out there. Uh, what happens next? Well, um, for me, I, I was fortunate enough to to start teaching there um, shortly after I had, I had I had left, and I actually think that that's. I kind of felt like that was the, an extension of my own studies because as soon as you have to teach something, you find out what you know and what you don't. Right. Um, because you're trying to verbalize it in a way that you know has to be coherent. You become so, a better artist when you teach. Yeah, definitely. So um, I would certainly recommend that to anybody who's who's coming out of school. To, you know, teach as soon as you can. You, 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 there's somebody out there who knows less than you do, mm -hmm. and. Um, and so that, that was really helpful to me. That helped, obviously, with financially, just to sort of kind of bridge the gap as I was um, coming out of school. And, uh, you know, I was, of course I was young. I could live cheaply and, uh, and kind of just make that work for a while. So, Living cheaply in New York isn't easy. Well, as cheap as you can. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so then, then it's just a matter of trying to figure out what is it I'm going to paint now. And, you know, and that was what that time was for me. Uh, I think... I was I was always really dedicated to figurative work, um, and I again just sort of stumbled my way into portraiture, uh, which is good, which is great. Um, I didn't I didn't necessarily set out to be a portrait artist though. I think I was good at getting likenesses, and I had a particular um, sort of affinity for detail, and that found an audience. Mm -hmm. and, um, but portraiture has always been one of the pillars of you know, any of artist, artists' careers throughout history. Well, know? in a lot of ways, that put Sargent on the map. I mean, oh, Sar sure. Sargent yeah, yeah. Was, was doing uh, all the socialites in, in, uh, around the world, a, a lot of Americans. And these, of course, ended up in great collections and great museums. Uh, so it benefited him, benefited him a lot. Um, so you're doing a lot of commission work now. I am, yeah. So wh what's that world like? Um, well, it's good. I mean, I, I, it's incredible how many different people I've been able to meet mm -hmm. um, just through, through painting portraits and uh, all different kinds of walks of life and occupations in different parts of the world. I was doing a lot of portrait commissions in, in China for a mm -hmm. while there, and that was never something I expected that I was going to be doing. But I experienced a completely different part of the world and a um, completely different culture and... Uh, you know, it's a different, uh, different ideals of beauty mm -hmm. uh, and uh, learning, learning things. So how do you deal with that? Because the ideals of beauty in China are going to be different than what, what we would have here. Do you, sure. do you have to study that? Do you have to ask a lot of questions? What, because what you like and what they like might be completely well, different. Well, sure. It was kind of trial by fire, honestly. I mean, I yeah. just started doing them. And then you'd send photos for approval, and they'd say certain things. And, but they were just things that I didn't expect, it, just about, you know, 
had something to do with like the shape of their face or the, you know, the that are different than than the, what we would what we would assume, you know, in terms mm. of like how people are photoshopping their photos. Is, it's just it's just different there than it is here. Um, but so I just started to learn that and. Um, and, and pick it up, and then I, I would make the changes before they told me to, <laughs> in the <laughs> sort of, you know, the the latter ones. Um, but yeah, you know, it's an it, so portrait painting is an interesting, um, it's an interesting world, and um, I'm happy to do it. You know, I think oh, certainly a lot of it depends on your client and and um, what their expectations are, and so uh, learning learning how to deal with clients. I mean, or, you know, just uh, get along with them and understand what they're well, you're, you're doing, from, from what you've told me, you're doing some pretty prominent people around the world, and, and they're finding you, and, and it's, it's resulting in some beautiful portraiture. Thanks, yeah. Well, I'm um, certainly giving it a shot, and, the, and the, I, the goal, obviously, is to make these not just portraits, but also works of art, right. which is what and, Sargent accomplished. And I think so that's well. a huge difference, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, because there is a, um, there's a culture of what I would call uh, portrait painters, mm. um, people who are doing judges and lawyers and you know uh, city council members or whatever, and and some of them are are beautiful, sure. but there's a big difference between that kind of a portrait artist and a portrait artist who's focusing on on creating what we would consider to be a museum quality work of art, mm. and it and it's a very subtle difference. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, again, it's an art of subtlety. It's your choices that you're making in terms of the pose. Background colors, um, you know, some of it has to do with the technique, I think, certainly. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, what is that? I don't know. I think uh, I try to put my finger on that all the time, but I don't know exactly what it is. So anyway. Well, we we try. We have a, a conference called the Figurative um, Face Figurative Art Convention and Expo. Uh -huh. And we try to focus on the museum quality there. There are a lot of people who do portraiture and do, do figures. And we try and attract the people who are really focusing on making that museum quality work. You're going to be at one of them coming up. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to it as well, uh, as, as are a lot of people who are going to be attending. So uh, you have other dreams, though, of things that you'd like to accomplish. You love doing commissioned work. Um, what, what are some of those other dreams? What, what do you see yourself doing down the road when, when you're able? Sure, yeah, I mean, I love telling stories. I think that that's the, um, the medium of painting. That's, that's really what spans the test of time, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't mean that there needs to be some elaborate story, but just something, something that's emotional, something that is obviously very beautiful um, and timeless. So, I mean, that's, that's the sort of broadest way to sort of describe it. But I think I want to do more multifigurative things. I I'd love to do larger format things that, that the paintings that I, when, you, when I walk into museums that I'm just blown away by, you know, your Van Dykes or Rubens or whatever. Um, so I think, I'm, I think building towards that, because there's a whole host of things that go along with trying to put something like that together. Massive, massive effort. I don't think people realize the amount of oh, sure. time and effort to do a big painting like that. It, you know, everything in terms of time is amplified. Sure. Um, you know, getting the figures, you know, even stretching the canvas, I mean, just everything is... It's incredibly difficult. The costs, the model costs. Um, yeah, I mean the time cost alone is what makes it difficult, and then just finding the finding the outlet for it. You know, the trying to find where's this going to go, where's this going to be purchased or be displayed. Um, the larger you go, you know, then there's this, the kind of the market tends to shrink. Just you know, depending on exactly where your market is, and right. there there are certain niches. And I'm right. sure not everybody can, can hang a big painting exactly. in their house. Right. Uh, I'd like to talk about this realism movement because I think this sure. relates relates to that. Um, when we started Fine Art Connoisseur, uh, this realism movement was really, really tiny. Mm. There, were, there were a small number of people, there were you know, a handful of ateliers and a handful of artists who were trying to bring back the classics. Mm. And though they were not trying, my, my sense is they were not trying to replicate the past, they were trying to put classics in a contemporary environment, mm. uh, meaning classics for today. Art had gone 
far, far away from that, yeah. right? So starting with the Armory Show in, what was it, 1911, I believe, the Armory Show is when the modernists were first shown in, in New York, right. and then it kind of spread, and those modernists were all classically trained. Mm -hmm. And then the next generation of modernists said, well, I can do that, I don't have to be classically trained, and then, of course, it's gone, um, you know, the pendulum has gone far, far out, so people who are making livings that are you know, abstract expressionists and so on, and I'm not being critical of that, it's just that they didn't have to have that kind of training. Sure. And so it, it appears, though, the pendulum is swinging back. And it appears to me that, you know, there's, there's always a generation or two um, where things move in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So kids tend to not do what their parents and grandparents wanted to do. And, and what we're seeing is an explosion of young people who, mm -hmm. like yourself, uh, and a lot of a lot of people who are you know fresh out of college or going into college, you know, 20 years old, who are wanting to do this kind of art instead of wanting to do the things that are ha hanging on their parents or grandparents' walls. Yeah. Why do you think that is? That's a good question. I mean, I think there, the, like anything else, there's many factors. I I, I do think um, you know there's just this this just simple kind of wow factor in being able to draw. In, paint something that looks like something you know so I think I think generally people are kind of like always drawn to that and maybe it just culturally wasn't at the forefront for however many decades in the 20th century um, I think certainly the internet has played a role in the ability of people to find out that this is happening and things like Instagram you know we can have these love-hate relationships with these things but they allow people to build followings and to get excited about things that are out there and, and mm -hmm. have access to things that they would otherwise probably not see. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, would, I would say that has a lot to do with that. I mean, I have, a, I have, I have some, you know, quite a large subsection of my followers from, from Iran um, on Instagram. Yeah, and yeah we, we were having that discussion yesterday. Why are we getting so many people from Iran? And yet there seems to be a lot of love and passion. It, these are not, um, uh, some, some people buy followers and right. from foreign countries and so on just to build their audiences. So this is not that. These are people who are truly interested. But how cool is that? I mean, yeah, you know, it's fabulous. And but I think because it's completely out of different culture, different cultures. It's completely out of sort of like the, you know, I think in the 20th century there was it was just it was just smaller and tighter. There were fewer people who con controlled what was what was going to get out there, particularly in universities and what was taught. And so there's just gatekeepers are losing their their power, and so, but I mean, if somebody still wants access to that, fine, they they can have access to it. But you know, this this other thing is still um, vital and it's growing. So if you're living in a place, maybe like Iran or or you know anywhere in the world, and you don't have access to an atelier or to a really brilliant instructor, hmm. what's your best advice for people? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think that there's a tremendous amount of good information and instruction you can get online now, uh, certainly videos. I mm -hmm. know many people who are um, just absorbing that. I think that I think that the person who is inquisitive and, uh, you know, studious, hardworking, um, willing to put in the time to, to practice, they, they can find, um, they can problem solve, and they can find that information through those, through those materials. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's you know, devour as much as you can, Th you know, think, I would, I would tell them to think as, um, as much as they possibly can about, you know, um, the, the techniques themselves are understandable, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? So you can go out there and you can, you can, you can problem solve, and it, it's, not, it's not just this sort of subjective nebulous thing, you know, so. What, what are the dangers of being self-taught, practicing, uh, there's a line that I heard recently, practice doesn't make perfect, sure. practice makes permanence. Right. So if, if, you're, if you're practicing something that's, like, let's say, drawing, yeah. and, you're, and you're practicing bad drawing skills, right. how do you get around that? Right. Well, you could potentially find certain techniques that you're going to eventually have to unlearn because if, if they're just something about um, the, the particular ideals that, that just don't add up. Um, so I get a lot of students, you know, who will come from just different academies or different um, uh, philosophies, and if I can 
just explain to them these simple ideas of form and light and how that works. It's just like light bulbs go off because it's, a, it's an underlying principle that makes sense, that's logical, and that you can, uh, you can, you can think about and, and find the right answer like math or science or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, there tends to be a badge of courage of being self-taught. And, and I, to me, I think that that um, is folly. And, sure. and, and the reason I say that is because um, the way that we have learned to paint was by being passed from generation mm. to generation, you know, whether it was Rembrandt or others who were passing it on to their students and spending years, in some cases, with those people and, and helping formulate that versus going out there and experimenting. You waste so much time. Oh, sure. And, and it seems like... Uh, the best possible way is to study under somebody who's already figured it out. Well, it's so much more efficient. I mean, we let let you know all of their problem solving and all of their dead ends just you know fuel you, so you don't have to go down all of those different. That's paths. right. Yeah. You don't have to make those mistakes. Sure. You're going to make plenty anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, Josh, this has been fabulous today. It, it's it's fun to learn about you and to learn about your career, um, the path that you took. Hmm. Uh, I just want to acknowledge you. You're a fabulous painter. You're inspiring a lot of people. And to think that at your relatively young age that you're as accomplished as you are, I, I just can't wait to see what you're doing when you're my age. And I'll, and I'll be, be here watching. All right. <laughs> well, thanks so much. It's been a lot of fun to talk to you. And, and um, I really do want to help. You know, I want to help others and find sort of their way into this. And so um, I hope I'm playing some small part in that. It shows. It absolutely shows. I think it's important. Thanks. Well, this has been Interviews with the Artist, and this is Josh LaRock. Thanks again for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. Well, that segment was from Classical Portraiture with Joshua LaRock. We hope you enjoyed it. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. I'm Eric Rhodes. Thanks for watching today. If you've learned only one path to developing your art, you may be limiting your own problem-solving skills. You can't do what you don't know how to do. This is why it's so important to study under different artists and instructors. You must learn multiple methods to navigate the unexpected difficulties any painting might throw at you. The risk of not having alternative problem-solving methods is perilous. You could be nearly finished with a grand painting and find yourself unable to go any further. Maybe you've experienced this already. With new insights, you'll see different paths and have multiple ways of dealing with issues that come up as you start and progress through a painting. In Classical Portraits, artist Joshua LaRock will show you his proven methods to investigate issues. Think clearly through each option and decide on the best way to proceed. Never again will you be held up because you don't know how to get past the problems you encounter while developing your painting. It's a simple question, but it's more than just good drawing. It's more than just getting the likeness, you know. If we get this right, um, we translate something of our sitter's personality, something of their humanity and their essence. So um, it's kind of elusive, but it's really, really satisfying, really, really challenging. Josh is recognized as one of the preeminent figurative artists living today. His paintings are rooted in classical techniques, yet filtered through a contemporary sensibility. I'm really influenced by, uh, by William Bouguereau. He's a 19th century French academic painter. And so what I'm going to be showing you here is more or less um, what I've gleaned from his processes. More than the method or the process or the materials, specific materials that I'm using, I want you guys to be able to take away some, some problem-solving tools that you can use in your studio to do self-learning. Um, and hopefully kind of dispel a lot of the confusion. He combines the best of age-old techniques with a positive, modern approach to his subject matter. Josh's tried-and-true solutions will be a new and refreshing approach as he encourages you, especially while you're learning to break things down into components rather than tackle everything at once. Now you have the opportunity to learn to achieve these great results for yourself available on both DVD and digital format to view on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Order Classical Portraits with Joshua LaRock today.